um, it's closer to 1 a.m. here, um, but I'm still uh, delighted to, to be part of uh, this whole forum. Um, I guess the first slide is, is one which asks the question rebadging or revisioning, uh, revisioning, uh, you know, is it more of the same or is it about new possibilities or opportunities? My brief background was 30 years as a, as a cop with the New South Wales Police. Um, for, for a decade, I was a senior elected official of the largest police union in Australia. For the last 20 years, um, I, um, I've worked uh, across the world in, in many different educational uh, and institutional settings. I, I was a university graduate at uh, age 40, um, probably known in the UK as the, as the cop who introduced restorative uh, policing or restorative justice to uh, Thames Valley Police in the early 1990s. Um, whilst uh, the, the, uh, the introduction is talking about restorative, uh, I'll give you a little hint that the, the word restorative was not my favorite word. It was really about uh, relationships. And I attempted to change the, the sort of notion of restorative to relational, but I was un, unsuccessful. Let, let me just um, get this slideshow happening. Um, Just, just take a moment to think about the common theme in each of the presentations. And um, it really was, was about possibilities uh, and opportunities. Uh, what, what did each of the presenters sort of identify as a key impediment? Well, there are a range of, range of issues. Um, but before I, I go too far, I just want to raise what I think is a fundamental issue in terms of how I view all things policing. And that is um, the assumption and where assumptions fit. And if I said the assumption about innovation is we all hold the same view and the answer is we don't. And how do I know? Well, I don't because uh, we haven't tested it. And why I'm saying that is, um, I, I think that is the critical question we need to keep foremost in our minds. For example, let me give you three examples of assumptions. One assumption is police are resistant to change. Another assumption, police are resistant to change that is imposed. And the final is, assumption is police are off open to change that they are they are part of and that it makes sense now i've i'm been known as questions uh, because i'm very socratic and if we know anything about socrates he, he asked questions in order to make us think about ideas we took for granted um, so I put it out there because it helps you to understand the sort of evolution of my thinking and practice. But, but if we're talking about innovation, we, we have to find a place to start that, uh, that gives us a, a sound basis on which to develop this conversation. What is policing? Where is it now? How did it get there? Why did police struggle? and innovation and frontline policing. Someone said to me, an oxymoron, but anyhow, I see it as a possibility. The notion, what is policing? Um, my, my claim is that it's really a series of relational interactions. Um, isn't everything in life? After all, we're, we're sort of hardwired for connection. We derive our identity from relationships. Policing is really about the ebb and flow of emotional exchanges. You know, I often think we, we train police hostages uh, 
to 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 navigate uh, highly emotional and intense situations. And I wonder what we might be able to learn from them that might help improve the quality of policing generally. It's largely about quality of life issues, not law enforcement. That's what struck me from the first time when I joined as a cop. Um, I really, I really can't remember ever being called to a neighbourhood because things were going well. And it raises a couple of issues, given that uh, our increasing reliance on what I see as a blunt instrument, that's the criminal justice system. Why, why, do, why do criminal justice systems struggle with when it comes to relational issues? For example, what assumptions explain why there's an increasing focus on criminal justice as the answer to family violence. And policing, and others have talked about it, are about the most vulnerable groups, uh, those who struggle around connection, social disadvantage, the risk of a number of, on a number of industries such as health, education, crime, and so on. And this is the big one. Uh, policing is part of a broader institutional and political system that's driven by in, institutional imperatives. And there's, there's a great TED talk by Hilary Cotton who titled Why Social Services Are Broken. And, and, um, and what she did is identify the, that 90% uh, that of, of of the time is for by professionals is spent servicing the system. She gave examples of uh, a couple of case studies where there were, were one family serviced by 74 agencies and, uh, and not one of them could be accused of making a difference. So, so it raises some fundamental issues that, that that invariably police a part of, and that is the, the challenge of the institutional paradigm and the sort of professional expert model. And interesting, um, Cottom's answer to all of this was, was, was found in relationships. Where is policing and how did it get there? How would you know? It's very interesting. My, my simple approach is to take the temperature on the ground, engage frontline police officers. But not only that, what, what are the other indicators? And we talk about culture, take a cultural survey. And, and I've been fortunate to work throughout the world in policing and education. And, and there's a similarity, regardless of what country you're in, that, uh, that when you take the temperature on the ground, um, and in fact, if you asked operational cops, what would a reformed organisation, policing organisation look like? They'll quote you almost verbatim what the, the cultural surveys say um, or fine, which really should come as no surprise. So what we're talking about is, is enacting a, a profession or a practice uh, in, in, a, in a less than ideal learning environment, uh, influenced by command and control, a practice that's built on on, on, on custom and practice where, where the compliance is in fact a, a dominant measure. Uh, reality is there's very little meaningful engagement, poor pedagogical practice, and in fact, no real ownership. Now, if we, we're talking about innovation, uh, we, we can't ignore the elephant that's trash in the room. Um, 
So let me just roll on by saying, how, how did it get to this place? And I, go, I guess uh, mention was made of the systems being, being broken. Um, I, I, I think the system of dominance by the state, you know, which has evolved over time, you know, which Nils Christie identified as being the state uh, sterling private conflicts. In other words, the notion of getting away from a communitarian approach where policing is about community governance. Um, and then, then we've suffered paralysis by analysis, over-engineering. And of course, we're, we're living in an increasingly disconnected and fractured world. Um, then when you ask police about their practice, uh, it's really interesting. You, and the, the question I, I often ask is, what do you do? Why do you do that? How do you, how does doing that make a difference? And how would you know? And most really struggle. But the good news is, so do other professions. And that doesn't suggest that what they're doing isn't working. It's just that it's not explicit. Now, the implications of that are far reaching. But What's interesting is when you ask police about the last time they made a difference, um, uh, there's a struggle because they, it's not part of the, the, the normal narrative making a difference. And when I say, can you give me an example of where you made a difference? And most struggle. And yet my contention is that Police make a difference. Most police make a difference every day. Now, let me let me just unpack that in a way that makes sense of what, what I've just asserted. I say, give me an example of the last time you had someone come into the police station, report their vehicle had been broken into. They come in a highly agitated, emotional state. Um, with a whole lot of expectations of you. And, um, and what are those expectations? Well, that you'll sort of drop everything, that you'll pay attention and you'll rally the resources and you'll find the baddies and all the rest of it. And the conversation goes like this, is that your experience? The answer is yes. Then I said, then you spend 20 minutes with them and there's a transformation. Uh, they, they leave um, happy, uh, uh, less emotional. Um, and what happened? And when you start to get operational cops to deconstruct that, they talk about the process, the relational interaction that it was inherently fair and respectful. They had a voice, uh, they were taken seriously. Um, the police officer was very transparent about what was possible, what wasn't. And you know, while we talk about, while we talk about innovation, I, I'm really interested in shining the spotlight on what it is we do that that actually makes a difference every day because that's the foundation on which a different narrative, a different conversation uh, needs to take place. Now, understanding why police struggle and the importance of connecting the why to the what. In June of 1973, when I was a really good looking young cop, uh, I'm not sure what happened, but, uh, and I, uh, I had apprehended a young guy, Gary, 14 years of age, in a, in a community hall where there was a dance in progress. 
that he'd been fighting and I attempted to remove him from the hall. And in the process, I let him go and turned my back. And when I looked back, he threw a punch and knocked me to the ground. He hit me in the eye. What I learned from my colleague was that this young fellow had been arrested on a number of occasions for violence. And, uh, and on this occasion, um, he was likely to go to, to juvenile prison for, or detention for, for a minimum of 12 months. But uh, what struck me was I, I knew what he was doing, but I, I needed to understand why he was doing it. And unless I was able to help him to understand the why of what was happening, um, the idea of sending him to prison wasn't going to help. And so rather than take him to the police station and charge him, I took him to his home and had his mum turn up the next day with him at 3 p.m. My eye was partially closed and um, she came in and uh, was in tears when she looked at me and we had a conversation. And the conversation was built on, I need to understand what was happening. Um, his mum said she loved him dearly, but he was, he, he became a very angry young man. I said, when did that happen? She said, well, probably the, over the last 12 months or so. And I said, so, was there anything in particular that happened? And she said, oh, well, the only thing I can think of, his dad was killed in a motor vehicle accident. And of course, Gary burst into tears. The, the, the short and the tall of it is that um, that interaction with Gary, and I, I didn't charge Gary. In fact, um, 15 years later in the same hall, I got a tug on my shirt. I look around, here's Gary. He said, do you remember me? I said, I remember you, you little shit. You hit me in the eye. And he said, I never quite understood why you gave me a break. And I said, what's happened for you since? He said, I'm happily married. I never got into trouble again, but two kids and life's good. You see, what I've learned is that that Gary's story is emblematic of everything we do in policing. He was in a highly emotional state. His young person didn't know how to manage the trauma of what was happening. The sense of shame was overwhelming and his incapacity to manage that shame meant he, he transacted it by way of violence. So what's fundamental to where I come from is to understand the why of what we do. Um, and that's so critical because the saying I coined is without the why, the what looks like more of the same. Um, in other words, if I go back to 1989, when I was in a place called Wagga Wagga, um, a large rural city between Sydney and Melbourne, uh, I was given responsibility for managing a, a small unit of 14 young police in a proactive capacity. And, and that was my first opportunity to change the policing conversation. And we sat in circles and I asked them the questions. Why did you become a police officer? What, what was your motivation? Um, what do you enjoy? What were your expectations? What are the, what are, what are the challenges of day-to-day -day policing? What I got to discover was they were actually fairly vulnerable because they were not used to being part of a conversation. And, and over a two day period, they went from saying, Sarge, just tell us what to do, to saying, you know, how, how, how do we develop a, a mandate with community? How do we make what we do much more meaningful? 
And these were 14 individuals seconded to the unit that I was put in charge of who didn't want to be there. Uh, but within six months, I had a waiting list because what was happening is they felt connected. They developed strong collegial relationships. They learned to have a very different conversation. They learned to be vulnerable. And the idea of not knowing the answer was great. Um, you know, one, one, one of the, the, the considerable, I think, significant measures of, of what I saw change in the way policing was transacted over a two year period in Wagga between 1991 and 1993 was one of the indicators, a 73% reduction in the raw numbers put before the court. That was so significant. And, but what I got to understand because of my naivety that was, it wasn't a good news story because we were messing with an industry, but more of that later. The other story that is significant was um, in 1995, I set up a small unit within police headquarters and worked with 120 operational cops in a place called Waratah. And over the 12 month period, we used circles, we, we, we devolved, the old command and control model. We had police heavily invested emotionally with one another. Uh, new learning, a different narrative took place. And um, at the backdrop of a police royal commission into a systemic corruption, uh, our work was seen as an example of policing reform and was cited in parliament as a wonderful example. But if I said to you, we were closed down six weeks later, you'd probably be confused, but that's for another story. I just want to make the point that the institutional paradigm is soul destroying. It just saps the human spirit. You know, it, it trashes the sort of the, the moral imperative that motivates us to, to want to make a difference in people's lives. But let me say this, um, culture really is like a storybook. The way we change the stories, culture is to change the stories. So one of the very real indicators of change process was was when I was 12 months into this process of developing restorative, and it really wasn't about a program of dealing with young people. It was about, it was about a fundamental change in how we were policing. The beneficiaries and the focus was about young people, their families and victims, was that the conversations changed and in the meal room, I would hear cops saying to me, uh, uh, Toc, I was known as T-O-C, Toc. Toc, you know, she's not a bad old stick, that mum, you know, she, she's a battler, but she's got a good heart. Well, the same guy would have been saying to me, she's a bloody hopeless parent 12 months earlier. Let me just conclude by saying, That, that relationships aren't, aren't everything. They're actually the only thing. And that innovation of frontline policing, you know, and that's where it has to be because 90% of, of the best ideas that'd be found in frontline policing. I guess John Coxhead runs the argument that um, there aren't enough ideas because the, 
they haven't been given the opportunity to be shared. So my argument is visionary leadership and strong collegial relationships are the foundation on which, which policing can be improved and innovation becomes possible, you know? Change leadership is really about not being right at the beginning of the meeting, but being right at the end. The issue of a safe environment um, where vulnerability is seen as a strength. And I had mentioned when I was working with uh, these 14 young pleas, the idea of sitting in a circle, facing one another, and talking about things that they would never normally talk about, made them highly vulnerable. Now there's, there's a classic uh, TED talk by a woman by the name of Brené Brown, and I suggest you look at it, where she was the expert, a uh, social worker, wrote books, developed theories, but, um, but missed the point. And the point was about, the, about what it was about those individuals who saw vulnerability as being a strength and not a weakness. And she called these people who could manage vulnerability wholehearted people because they felt they were worthy of loving and belonging. Now, what's that got to do with policing? Well, well guess what? Um, if, if police themselves struggle with vulnerability, um, it raises some fundamental problems about how they police communities that are highly vulnerable. But regardless, they do a good they do a good job at it. You see, when we learn to sit with the discomfort of vulnerability, we're more likely to be involved in in dialogue that encourages rigor and debate, critique and challenge. It's a contest of ideas, not of personalities. We've heard, we've heard a fair bit about accountability, but my take on accountability that, that, that I think is, is so important that we tend not to think about it because the world of of regulation and risk averse and all the rest of it. You see, see the accountability that matters for me in a profession we call policing is the internal accountability. And in a, in a, in a process of building strong collegial relationships, the accountability I have is to you and you to me to, to those that we, we hope to serve, and not, a, not, a, not totally consumed by this external accountability that we all talk about. I'm not suggesting for a minute that isn't important because, look, here's the bottom line. The argument I put up about police doing lots of useful stuff every day is based on the notion that they treated others in a fair and respectful way. And now, now it sounds common sense, absolutely is, but Tom Tyler in his book, Why People Obey the Law, found that most people are most likely to obey the law most of the time, if they're treated fairly and respectfully. Now, now, what's particular about my approach is that when we understand the why of the what, we become much more explicit in terms of what works and understanding why it works. 
So here's the challenge I throw is that if we just focus on the quality of those relationships, it could be and would be a game changer. Well, my experience of working not only in policing, but with agencies and, and in schools uh, is, is evidence of that. You know, my greatest challenge was not making it happen or helping it to happen, but sustaining it. Because if, if, if I need to be reminded of it, is if I go back to my experience in Wagga where we made a significant difference in terms of the raw number of offenders we put before the court, yet I was enemy number one. Juvenile justice lost half its workload. The, the juvenile detention center had a vacancy rate and so on. And why I'm saying that is look, it, 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 with all the complexities of our society and, and the challenges of policing, we need an entry point where we can attract others into a space that provide mutual benefit. And all I'm saying is that until we learn how to relate in a, in a strong collegial way with one another, we don't have a modelling or a practice we can all apply universally so we can engage and collaborate with the community. The answers to innovation a reveal when police have a shared understanding of what matters. Because until we actually understand what matters, um, we can't work out who matters. I'll leave it at that.